your sin. He is the one who loves you first, the one who knew you before birth, before creation of the earth. Jesus calls you out of darkest night, welcomes you into the light. He is the one that you can trust. Someone bled for you, died for you, sought to make you his. Then he rose for you and clothed you in his righteousness. Someone bled for you, died for you, sought to make you his. Then he rose for you and clothed you in his righteousness. Hey there, my name is Tim and you've joined in the New Life at Home broadcast this morning. Uh, we at New Life are a community that longs to make Jesus known, that longs to go deeper into the hope that we have in him. And so thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if you'd like to connect further with our church community, if you'd like someone to get in touch with you, if you'd like to meet some people from our church, or perhaps you want to share what we can pray for you, you can jump on our website, discovernewlife.church forward slash get connected, uh, and you can leave your details and a message for us there. Uh, but how about I start our time uh, this morning by leading us in prayer. Uh, you can pray along with me in your hearts uh, in the comfort of your own home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for who you are. Uh, you are always good. Uh, you're always loving. You're always in control. Even when we uh, can't see uh, what you're doing, your hand is at work in all things, bringing about your plans and bringing about uh, your purposes. Lord, we praise you for saving us in Jesus. We praise you for making him known to us that by his death and resurrection we have new life. We praise you that through Jesus we have peace with you. We can be friends with you. We can call you our father. We can be part of your family with Jesus as our older brother and be brought into relationship with your people. And we praise you for giving us your spirit, your spirit that opens up our hearts to understand your truths and your wonders, Lord. Uh, but we do fail. Uh, we fail every day in what we think, 
in what we say and in what we do. Uh, Please forgive us for the times uh, this week that we've failed. Please renew us uh, in Christ uh, to live new lives in view of his mercy. Uh, May these words motivate our lives uh, as we seek to live for you in everything we do, wherever we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing in our sermon series in the book of Romans, Lasting Hope, and we're up to Romans chapter 13. If you've got a Bible uh, there at home, open it up to Romans chapter 13 and we'll read it together. Romans 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right. And you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for our good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who will give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. It was my mum's birthday earlier this month and whenever mum's birthday comes around, I have the same question every year. What do I get her? There's nothing she really needs, so it's a question of what she might want. But what does mum want? What kind of gift would she value and appreciate? What kind of gift would please her? Something sentimental? Something practical? 
I don't know. Can you relate to this? Do you know someone that it's really hard to buy for? Someone you find it hard to know what to give? Well, for me, it's my mum and my dad, actually. So when her birthday comes around, I always need help. I've Googled gift ideas for mum. I've asked my brother many times. Thankfully, this year, Kate, my wife, helped me to pick something out. But sometimes Kate is just as clueless as I am about what my mum might want. But what about God? What does God want? What does God want from me? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever wondered? Well, when it comes to what God wants, he doesn't leave us clueless. In the book of Romans, God makes it clear. He's clear on the kind of gift that he accepts. He's clear on the kind of gift that pleases him. Let's remind ourselves of it from Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What does God want from me? He wants me to give him everything. Your whole life. He doesn't just want two hours of your life on a Sunday. He wants every hour of every day, seven days a week. See, what we have to remember is that living for God doesn't mean that we're kind of lifted out of ordinary life onto some higher spiritual plane. Living for God means living for him in the office, at school, in your family, at uni, in your car, on the sporting field. God wants us to love and serve him in the nitty-gritty of life. And last week, if you were tuning in, we started to see what that looked like, what that means for our lives, spelt out in concrete acts of service and love. But let's not forget those five words, in view of God's mercy. Those five words that can be a slogan for how we live our life. Everything in Romans 12 to 16 hangs off these five words. And the reality is that we can't actually please God. We can't give him what he wants unless we first accept what he gives us. It's only the one who knows Jesus, who's received the free gift of salvation in him, who by faith has been justified, made right with God, reconciled, made friends with God, forgiven, transformed. It's only this person, the one who knows this mercy, who can please God, who can give him their lives. So the first question is, do you know the mercy of God? Have you accepted God's gift of life? Because if you do, if you have, then in view of his mercy, God wants you to live for him in the ordinary, everyday realities of life. And part of the ordinary, everyday world is the law, isn't it? Government, authorities, and God wants us to submit to them. We're looking at chapter 13, verse 1. In view of God's mercy, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Last week, we heard about the renewed and lowly mindset of the believer. Submitting to authorities is a concrete expression of this. Submission is about recognising there is order, that there are people who have authority over us that we're to honour and obey in the Lord. But why? Why should I submit to the government? Why should I submit to SCOMO, to the tax office, to the police, to the school principal? We're given two reasons. Firstly, and most importantly, the authorities are established by God. Look from the second half of verse 1. For there is no authority except that which God has set up governments and authorities, and he's given them the sword. Literally, in Roman times, that, but that is, he's given them the right and responsibility to punish wrongdoers, that's the point. So, if you don't want to get in trouble, God says, submit to them. 
About 10 years ago, I got booked for speeding. It was on the federal highway. There were roadworks. It was an 80 zone and I was doing 100. I remember at the time thinking it was so unfair. I couldn't see much roadworks going on for a start and the speed camera was in one of those sneaky spots that you don't see until it's too late. But what would God say? He would say, if you didn't want to get booked for speeding, you shouldn't have been speeding. You broke the law, you pay the fine. Stop disrespecting me by disrespecting the authorities that I've put in place. The authorities are part of how God cares for his world, aren't they? Part of how he restrains evil, part of how he maintains order. They're there for our good. Just imagine living in a place where there's no authority, but anarchy and disorder, where people walk past bodies on the street, and that's normal. Even bad government is better than no government. In view of his mercy, God wants us to submit to the authorities because he has established them for our good. But of course, the big question this all raises is the but what about if question. It's kind of like the the elephant in the room, a question that comes into your mind as soon as you read this command to submit. What about if the government persecutes Christians? What about if the government is introducing laws that are out of step with God? What about if the government is evil? What then? Well, the first principle to uh, keep in mind is that obedience to God comes first. See, every authority has the lordship of Christ over it. So if obedience to that authority means disobeying God or against our consciences or to put us against our consciences as Christians, then we have to disobey. The apostles continued preaching the gospel when they were told not to. They said we must obey God rather than man. The midwives in Exodus wouldn't kill the baby boys because they feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. Daniel, right after the law is introduced banning prayer, goes up and kneels down in front of a window and gets thrown into a lion's den. There are times where civil disobedience is appropriate. But it's rare, for us anyway. Nevertheless, as Christians, we're coming up against these issues more and more. Uh, Issues such as the beginning and end of life, sex and gender, among others. And together, we need to be exploring how we'll respond when the pressure comes, when we feel the heat. What will you hold the line on? How will you respectfully take your stand? When will you just keep your head down? It's important to think these things through. There are times for civil disobedience, times to disobey the authorities in order to obey God, but we shouldn't be quick to. A bloke called R.C. Sproul picks up on something really important uh, in relation to this. This is what he says. He says, we are not free, however, to disobey the civil magistrate when we disagree with it or when authorities make us suffer or experience inconvenience. It is ironic that this master text on civil obedience was written to the Roman Christians who were under the heavy hand of imperial Rome. If Roman Christians could submit to the Roman government, then we can submit to our government. And so when, we, when I go over to the uh, school hall in a little while and uh, sit in my household as we're spaced out uh, in the school hall, even though that's inconvenient, even though that's a bit annoying and not ideal, even though I might not think that's totally fair when, you know, people can go to concerts in large crowds and, and not really social distance, even though all of that is in my mind, I'm still to submit and do what's inconvenient in honour and respect for the authorities. But the point of Romans 13 is is not to answer the but what about if questions. 
The point of Romans 13, in view of God's mercy, is to call us to submit. So in verse 7, we see what this looks like in ordinary, everyday life. And there are four examples. Four examples of what Christians are to give to the authorities, of what we owe. In view of God's mercy, Paul says, if you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Now, I don't reckon there's anyone who looks at their pay slip and says, oh, look at that. They took $500 out of my pay this week and they gave it to the government. Isn't that great? None of us thinks like that. Not even if you're a Canberra public servant, I'm guessing, when you're paid by people's taxes. Our default is to look inward, isn't it? And to seek our own benefit. Not to look outward and seek the benefit of the common good. But God's mercy transforms the believer to see themselves and their actions as contributing to God's good order. Christians in Rome were called to pay to Caesar what is Caesar's. We're called to pay to ScoMo what is ScoMo's. We're to be honest when we fill out our tax returns, to declare our income, to comply with GST laws and the like. The point is, in view of God's mercy, Christians pay what they owe. They pay for parking. We tap on and tap off on the light rail, even if no one's checking. We pay our way, it's what we do. But it's not just money that we owe, taxes and revenue. We owe respect and honour as well. No matter how much we might disagree with the government on some issues, no matter how much we might think politicians could do a better job, no matter what side of politics they're from or whether we voted for them or not, we owe them honour and respect. We need to hear this, don't we? Because sneering at our politicians and those in authority over us, it's, it's kind of a national sport, isn't it? We ridicule them, we sit in judgment of them. We click our way through a few articles and pick up snippets of knowledge and think that we know better and know best. We're much better at cutting down authority than we are at respecting it. It's a national sin. But don't get me wrong, we're free to disagree. That's one of the joys of living in a democracy. Submitting to authority doesn't stop you from having your say in a de democratic society. You can lobby the government. You can write to your local member. You can sign petitions. But there's a way to express disagreement that shows honour and respect, isn't there? And this is the same, this principle holds for all authority, parents, police, teachers, bosses, church leaders. Perhaps the greatest way we can honour and respect them is pray for them. Pray for the authorities over us. In view of God's mercy, pray for our teachers. Pray for your boss. Pray for your church leaders. Pray for our government. Submitting to the authorities is a concrete expression of living for God in the ordinary everyday world. Leave no debt outstanding. Pay what you owe. But there's a debt that you can't pay off. The debt of loving one another. There's a shift in the passage now from how we relate to those above us, those we might not ever rub shoulders with, to how we relate to those near us, those we most definitely will rub shoulders with. Verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Keep paying the never-ending social debt of love is the call. You can pay back a loan and it's done, but you can never pay the debt of love. No matter how much love I show you today, I'm still obligated to love you tomorrow. No matter what sacrifice I make today, I'm to put your needs first before my own tomorrow. In church community, among brothers and sisters in Christ, it means being gentle, having patience. It means serving side by side with those we might not click with or always agree with. It means extending hospitality, 
even when we don't feel like it's reciprocated. But the command applies more broadly, doesn't it? To our neighbour. We don't get to decide who we love. Our neighbour is not someone we choose, but someone God chooses. Our debt is to anyone who comes across our path. It's pretty radical, isn't it, this never-ending debt of love? But if we know God's mercy and we're growing into that, if that is our life slogan, if you like, if we know his love for us in Jesus, when we give our lives to him and love others in the same way he's loved us, we do something profound. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, it says in verse 8. Or down in verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. Love fulfills the law. This doesn't mean that we're saved by keeping the law. Only Jesus has kept the law and we're saved by faith in him. But by keeping the law, Jesus fulfills the law for us. But not only that, Jesus doesn't just fulfil the law for us, he fulfils it through us. And this is beautiful. We fulfil the law when we love like Christ. The Spirit enables us to do what the law intends and love is the intention of the law. In view of God's mercy, we're to love like Jesus. And when we do, we fulfil the law. But God defines how we do it, doesn't he? God defines what love is, not us. And the commandments in verse 9 show us that, don't they? We need God to show us the way. We need God to point us in the right direction because we live in a world that has made a mess of love. In our sin, we're natural lovers of self, not natural lovers of God and of others. And because of that, we've, we've become confused about love. Love has become broken. We might even use verses like this to, that say love sums up the law to, to then go, oh, well, I'm going to go and define for myself what love is then. We can justify all kinds of sin in the name of love, can't we? In the name of love, I can leave my spouse where the love is gone and start a new relationship. No. Love says I'll be true to my word and keep my promises. In the name of love, I can sleep with my boyfriend or girlfriend because one day we'll get married. No. Love says I'll treat someone with purity not as an object of my lust. In the name of love, I can hoard my wealth because, my, because I love my kids and I want them to have more than I ever had. No, love says, be generous. These verses are not an open door for us to define love for ourselves. God defines what's good and what's loving and what's not. God wants us to follow his direction the love that flows out of God's mercy is love directed by God's word. See, because of sin, it's kind of game over. We're unable to love as God intends, but because of Jesus, we are rebooted to love according to his word. In view of God's mercy, God wants us to live for him, by submitting to authorities and loving our neighbour. But what motivates us in living this out? What encourages us to live for God in the ordinary, everyday realities of life? Well, we've seen that it flows out of what God has done for us in the past in view of his mercy. But in the last section, and we'll end with this, we get another perspective. Our living for God now doesn't just look back to what God has done for us, isn't just motivated by that. Our living for God now also is shaped by what he will do for us in the future. It's shaped by our lasting hope. So Paul says in verse 11, and do this, that is, submit to the authorities, 
love one another, do this understanding the present time. Know the time is the call. And what's the time? It's time to wake up. Continuing in verse 11, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The, light, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. We get this picture of getting ready for the night to end. It's like you're lying in bed and you can see the dawn coming. It's time for you to wake up because every day is a day nearer to Christ's return. Be up and ready for Christ's return. You don't want to be wandering around in your PJs, metaphorically speaking, when he returns. When he returns, you want to be dressed and ready, that is, living for him in the ways that uh, unfold for us in this section of Romans. If you're a Christian, if you know Jesus, if you've put your trust in him, you've received the free gift of salvation. Your salvation is secured by Jesus' death and resurrection. But at the same time, you're still waiting for it in hope, waiting for the day when Jesus returns, waiting for the new creation where you'll be with God forever in perfect relationship with him and others. That's our lasting hope. That's what we're looking forward to. So in the ordinary, everyday realities of life, let's live in light of the day, submitting to authorities, loving our neighbour, dressed ready for the age to come. Let's pray. Our Father God, in view of your mercy, enable us to live lives that please you, in submission and in love. I pray that we will be motivated by what you have done for us in the past, saving us in Jesus by his death and resurrection, but also that we'll be looking forward to the day he returns and living lives dressed ready for that day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in this morning. Just to let you know, if you'd like to join us in person uh, for an in-person gathering, we meet each Sunday at 10.30am uh, in the school hall, the Ngunnawal School Hall next door to the church building. Uh, we'd love to meet you, uh, for you to join in with our community there and get to know uh, some people there. But until next time, goodbye.